This is the Digitally Rebastered Network. Greetings, gameheads. Eli Williams here, and we're doing something a little different and extra special for you. Back in the 80s, there was a company called The Mind's Eye that produced several audio dramatizations of popular pieces of literature, um, recordings of old radio shows, and the like. And for the longest time, I wanted copies of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, uh, but I was never able to get them because they were very expensive, these, these cassettes back in the day. And The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit came on uh, many volumes, but one Christmas my parents got for me The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, the story of the four animal companions, Mole, Water Rat, Mr. Badger, and Mr. Toad. And over the past several, several years, those tapes have deteriorated and are no longer able to be played. So I have been on a hunt for digital copies or actual physical copies of the story on those cassettes from the mind's eye, and they just don't seem to exist. I've looked everywhere on eBay and YouTube and, and just cannot find them. And a few months ago, I found someone on Reddit who said that they had them, they'd be willing to give them to anyone who wants them, and I contacted them and I was fortunate enough because it was an old thread that they still were there, they still had them, and they sent them to me, and now I have them. So I would like to share with you a piece of my childhood in four parts. I give to you the wind in the willows. Sit back, relax, and become enveloped in the story of these four characters. Enjoy. <laughs> The mole had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs with a brush and a pail of whitewash, till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. Father, hang spring cleaning. He bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. He scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged. Then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself. Up we go. Up we go. Till at last his snout came out into the sunshine and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. Ah, this is fine. This is better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur. Soft breezes caressed his heated brow. And after the seclusion of the cellarage he had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing almost like a shout. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily, along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. Then, as he looked, 
It winked at him and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began gradually to grow up round it, like a frame round a picture. A brown little face with whiskers, small neat ears, and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. Hello, Mo. Hello, rat. Would you like to come over? Oh, it's all very well to talk, but how am I to do it? The rat said nothing, but stooped and unfastened a rope and pulled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within, and was just the size for two animals. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that. There. Now then, step lively. Ah, ah. Oh, this is a wonderful day. You know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? Ne never been in a... <laughs> you never... Well, uh, what have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that? Nice? It's the only thing. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing about. Oh, oh, look, look ahead, Rat. Oh. Messing about in boats or with boats. <laughs> in or out of them, it doesn't matter. Look here, have you really nothing else on hand this morning? Supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it, hmm? Oh, what a day I'm having. Let's start at once. Uh, hold hard a minute, then. I've got something all ready at my place. Oh, oh, won't be but a minute. Here we are. Uh, uh, a, a wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, hmm? What's inside it? Oh, there's cold chicken inside it, and cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled gherkins, salad, french rolls, crest sandwiches, potted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, oh, soda stop, water. stop, stop. This is too much. You really think so? Oh, it's only what I always take on these little excursions. And it's so the mole much never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long, waking dreams. The water rat sculled steadily on without disturbing him for some half an hour or so. You must think me very rude, but all this is so new to me. So this is a river. How? The river. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life. By it, with it, and on it, and in it. It's brother and sister to me, and aunts, and company, and food and drink, and <laughs> naturally washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. But isn't it a bit dull at times? Uh, just you and the river, and no one else to pass a word with? <laughs> no one else to... <laughs> well, I mustn't be hard on you. You're, you're new to the river, and of course you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh, no, it isn't what it used to be at all. And what lies over there? That? Oh, oh, that's that's just the wild wood beyond the river. We we don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they... aren't they very nice people in there? Well, let me see. The squirrels are all right. And the rabbits, some of them, but <laughs> rabbits are a mixed lot. Then there's Badger, of course, so he lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, <laughs> nobody interferes with him. <laughs> They'd better not. <laughs> Why? Who should interfere with him? Well, of course, there, there are others. Weasels and stoats and foxes and so on. They're, they're all right in a way, but... Well, you can't really trust them, and that's a fact. And beyond the wildwood again... Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, and that's something that doesn't matter either to you or me. I've never been there, and I'm never going. Or you either, if you've got any sense at all. Ah, ah, now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to lunch, hmm? Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. It was so very beautiful that Mole could only hold up both forepaws and gas. Oh, my... Oh, my. 
Oh, my. Ah, ah there we are. Now, l- let me help you out. Careful, careful. Uh, there. <laughs> and here's the luncheon basket. Would you allow me the favor to unpack it, Ratty? Please do. Oh, oh my. Oh, my. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, my. Oh, I'll just stretch out here and rest a bit. Hmm? Oh, my. Oh, my. I think it's all ready, Ratty. Well, pitch in, old fellow. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, oh, my. Uh, Oh. What are you looking at? I'm looking at a streak of bubbles that I see traveling along the surface of the water. That is a thing that strikes me as funny. Bubbles! Oh! Greedy beggars! Uh, why didn't you invite me, Ratty? Oh, this was an impromptu affair. Oh. Uh, by, by the way, my friend, Mr. Moe. Oh, proud, I'm sure. Very pleased. Oh, such a rumpus everywhere. All the world seems out on the river today. Come on, old badger. That's just the sort of fellow he is. <laughs> Simply hates society. Well, we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us who's out on the river, hmm? Toad's out, for one, oh. in his brand new <laughs> racing boat. No togs, no everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, once it was nothing but sailing. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Punting? Yeah, pushing himself about in a boat with a pole. Yeah. <laughs> a nice mess he made of it. Huh? <laughs> Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. <laughs> oh, it's all the same, whatever he takes up. He gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. <laughs> oh, such a good fellow, too, but no stability. <laughs> Especially in a boat. <laughs> look, look, there he is now, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, eh? Toad! <laughs> He'll be out of the boat in a minute if he rolls like that, eh? <laughs> of course he will. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I suppose we ought to be moving, eh? Um, I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. Hmm? Oh, please, let me. Suddenly, without so much of a thank you, Otter disappeared into the water after an errant mayfly. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. Well, it never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything, and soon everything was packed, and they were off again in the boat. Ratty, I want to row now. Oh, not yet, my young friend. I don't know which you've had a few lessons. It's not as easy as it looks, you know. (laughs) The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air while Mole took his place. What? what? Stop it, you silly ass! You can't do it! You'll all have us over! Oh, don't worry, Ratty. I'll be just... Oh! 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 With a firm paw, the rat gripped him by the back of the neck, pulled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. (coughs) Ratty, (laughs) my generous friend, I am very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. (coughs) Will you overlook it this once and forgive me? And let things go on as before? <laughs> well, what's a little wet to a water at, eh? <laughs> Don't you think any more about it. Hey, look here, I really think you had better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know. <laughs> Not like Toad's house at all, but but you haven't seen that yet. But still, I can make you comfortable, and, and I'll teach you to row and to swim, and <laughs> you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us, eh? <laughs> And so this day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole. Each of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind, 
went whispering so constantly among the willows. If you please, I want to ask you a favor. Won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly. Get the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. There's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. <laughs> <laughs> he must be a very nice animal. He is indeed the best of animals. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses, eh? <laughs> and it may be that he's both boastful and conceited, but he's got some great qualities, says Toady. With Mole at the oars and the rat settled comfortably in the stern, the two animals moved quickly along the river in the bright sunshine. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall. Oh, my. And that creek on the left, where the sign says private no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse, where we leave the boat. Mm. Oh. The stables are over there to the right. Oh. Well, that's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. <laughs> Very yeah. old, that is, eh? Well, hey? <laughs> well, well. Toad's rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, so we, we never admit as much to Toad. Mm. Ah, there. Oh, Excellent landing, Mole, old fellow. <laughs> You're becoming an excellent boatman. Thank you. Oh, look at all those handsome boats slung from the crossbeams of the boathouse. Hmm, hmm, I understand. Boating's played out. Toad's tired of it now and done with it. <laughs> I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Well, come along and let's look him up. We shall hear all about it quite soon enough. It really is very beautiful, isn't it? And the flowers and lawn are quite breathtaking. Yes. Oh, there's Toad now, sitting in that wicker garden chair. Looks like he's reading a map. Hooray! This is splendid. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Oh, well, this, this is my friend Mo. Oh, yes, yes. Now what will you take? Come inside and, and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Oh, then let's just sit quiet a bit, Tony, eh? Much. Ah. What a delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river. Or anywhere else, for that matter. <laughs> oh, oh, Toad. Oh, all right, oh, Matty. It's only there. my way, you know. And it's not such a very bad house, is it? <laughs> you know, you rather like it <laughs> well, yourself. <that's> true. <laughs> now, look here. Let's be sensible. You're the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's, it's most important. Oh, it's, uh, it's about your rowing, I suppose. Well, you're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. Well, with a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching. Oh, well... poo boating, silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Oh. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows who ought to know better spending all your energies in that aimless manner. Oh. No, 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 no. I've discovered the real thing. The only genuine occupation for a lifetime. Oh, dear. Yes. Come with me, dear Raddy, and your amiable friend also, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. <laughs> He led the way accordingly, and there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common... The hedgerows, the rolling downs, camps, villages, towns, cities, here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. And mind, this is the very finest cart of its sort that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside, come inside, look at the arrangements. Phantom almost helped it. 
Why? Uh, see, all complete. You see, biscuit, potted lobster, oh. sardines, everything you can possibly want, you see. No? Soda water here, tobacco there, letter well. paper, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes. <laughs> You'll find that nothing, nothing, nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, but did I overhear you say something about we and start and... Uh... This afternoon. Now, you dear good old ratty, don't don't begin talking in that stiff and stiffy mm. sort of way. Because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you, so please consider it settled. And, and don't argue. Oh. Oh. It's the one thing I can't stand. Oh, well. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life mm. and just live in a hole in a bank and boat. Ah, I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. I don't care. I'm not coming, and that's flat. But... And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat, as I've always done. And what's more, Mo's going to stick to me and do as I do, aren't you, Mo? Eh? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, hmm? Of course I am. I'll always stick to you, Racky, and what you say is to be, uh, uh, has got to be. Right. Mm. Uh, all mm. the same, mm. it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather... Fun, you know. No, oh, well, what? come come along oh, in and, no. and have some lunch and we'll talk it over. Oh, well. oh no, no, we needn't decide anything oh. in a hurry. Of course, I don't really care. I only want to give pleasure to you oh, fellows. Yeah. Live mm-hmm. for others. That's my motto in life. During luncheon, Toad disregarded the rat and proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. He painted the prospects of the trip and the joys of the open life and the roadside in such glowing colors that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow it soon seemed taken for granted by all three of them that the trip was a settled thing. So when the old gray horse was caught and harnessed, they set off, all talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft as the humor took him. Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come while stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular came to keep them company and listen to their talk. Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life for a gentleman. Yes, talk about your old river. I don't talk about my river. You know I don't, Toad, but I think about it. Ah. I think about it all the time. The mole reached out from under his blanket, felt for the rat's paw in the darkness, and gave it a squeeze. Do whatever you like, Ratty. Shall we run away tomorrow morning quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole on the river? No, 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 no. We'll see it out. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by Toad till this trip is ended. <laughs> Wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. His fads never do. Good night. After so much open air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly, and no amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed next morning. So, while Rat saw to the horse and lit a fire and cleaned last night's cups and platters and got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged off to the nearest village, a long way off, for milk and eggs and various necessaries that the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The hard work had all been done, and the two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted by the time Toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life it was they were all leading now, after the cares and worries and fatigues of housekeeping at home. At last, they were on their way again, strolling along the high road, when far behind them, they heard a faint, warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. 
glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark center of energy advancing on them at an incredible speed, while from out the dust a faint boop, boop, wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. In an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest pitch, it was on them. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittery plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, with its pilot tense and hugging the wheel, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance. Uh, you, you villains! You scoundrels! You, you highwaymen! You, you road hogs! I'll have the law on you! Oh, look at the cart, Ratty. It's a complete wreck. I'll oh, report them. I'll take them through all the courts. Oh, oh. oh, look at this mess. Windows smashed, sardine tins scattered over the wide world. Oh, oh. Hey, Toad, come and bear a hand, can't you? Poop, 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 poop. Are you coming to help us, Toady? Glorious, stirring sight. The poetry of motion. The real way to travel. Here today, in next week tomorrow, villages skipped, towns and cities jumped. Always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss. Oh, poop, poop. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad. Oh, and to think I never knew. All those wasted years that lie behind me, I never knew, never even dreamt. But now what dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way? What carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset? Horrid little carts, common carts, canary-colored carts. What are we to do with him? Nothing at all. Because there really is nothing to be done. You see, I know him from old. He's now possessed. He's got a new craze, and it always takes him that way in its first stage. (laughs) Oh, never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart. Come on. It's five or six miles to the nearest town. We shall have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better, huh? Poop, poop. But what about Toad? We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself. It's not safe. Supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad. I've done with him. Please be sensible, Toady, and come along. As soon as we get to town, you'll have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about that motor car and who it belongs to and lodge a complaint against it. Police station? Complaint? Me complain of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been vouchsafed me. You fellows can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you, and then I might never have seen that, 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 that swan, that sunbeam, that, that thunderbolt. I might never have heard that entrancing sound. Oh, I owe it all to you, my best of friends. You see what it is? He's quite hopeless. I give it up. And if ever you catch me going up pleasuring with this provoking animal again... During the rest of that weary trudge, the rat addressed his remarks exclusively to Mole. On reaching the town, they left the horse at an inn stable and gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Then they caught a slow train that eventually landed them at a station not very far from Toad Hall. They escorted the spellbound, sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. Then they got out their boat and sculled down the river home. The following evening, the mole was sitting on the bank fishing when the rat came strolling along to find him. Oh, heard the news. There's nothing else being talked about all along the riverbank. Toad went up to town by early train this morning, and he's ordered a large and very expensive motor car. Oh, my.
The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage, and, though rarely visible, to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever the mole mentioned his wish to the water rat, he always found himself put off. Oh, Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up, and then I'll introduce you. <laughs> Best of fellows. But you must not only take him as you find him, <laughs> but when you find him, what, eh? <laughs> Could, couldn't you ask him here dinner or something? Oh, it wouldn't come. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that sort of thing. Well, then, supposing we go and call on him. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all. He's so very shy, he'd be sure to be offended. I've never even ventured to call on him at home myself, although I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does. You told me the wild wood was all right. Oh, I know, I know. So it is. But um, I think we won't go there just now. Not just yet. He'll be coming along someday if you wait quietly. Hmm? The mole had to be content with this. But the badger never came along. And when summer was long over, Mole found his thoughts dwelling again on the solitary grey badger who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the wild wood. One afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the fire was alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, Mole formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought that he had never seen so far and so intimately into the insides of things as on that winter day when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hard, and stripped of its finery. With great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wild wood. There was nothing to alarm him at first entry, but he penetrated to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer, and holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The, du the, du the dusk, dusk, steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder, and indistinctly that he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. Better not begin imagining things, or there'll be simply no end to it. Yes, there's... Another face? Uh, no. Yes, certain. A little narrow face with hard eyes. The mole hesitated, braced himself up for an effort, and strode on. Then suddenly, as if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him. Then, still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him. As he halted in indecision, it broke out on either side. They were up and alert and ready, whoever they were. And he, he was alone and unarmed, and far from any help, and night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first. Then he knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be first one, and then the other, then both. As he stood still to listen, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. Wait! But the rabbit dashed past and disappeared down a burrow. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, 
closing in round something or somebody. In panic, he began to run too aimlessly. He knew not whither. He ran up against things. He fell over things and into things. He darted under things and dodged round things. At last, he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree. As he lay there panting and trembling and listened to the whistlings and the patterings outside, he knew at last that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. <laughs> 